Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Well, let's go ahead over to the fourth chapter of the book of Romans. We may want to back up a little bit uh, where it says, therefore, verse 28 of chapter 3, it says, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith uh, without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God also shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Do we make, the vo uh, make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we established the law. And that's kind of where we ended up last week. Uh, so we, we've gotten through these three chapters, and Paul uh, concluding the Gentiles under sin, the Jew under sin, all under sin, and all have equal access to the same redemption in Christ Jesus. Can we say amen? <clears throat> then he starts out in chapter 4 and says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? In other words, our natural lineage of Abraham, what did he find? What, what is it that he learned in his walk with God? For if Abraham were justified by works. Now understand. Now, we, you've got to read stuff within its context. You have to read it within what is being said and why it's being said. When he's talking about works here, being justified by works, he's talking about what? Being justified, declared righteous by adhering to the works of the law. Okay? Not, you know, once you get saved, God expects you to live right. Some people say that's works. That's not works. Well, it is works. But you're created in Christ Jesus unto good works. The Bible says. It doesn't, but you're not going to get saved by carrying your turtle doves or by, you know, by giving your different offerings, the five different offerings, the three voluntary and the three two involuntary uh, offerings every year in Jerusalem and all the trespass and the meal and the wave and the, you know, the, uh, the burnt, and, I, mean, I mean, the sin offering and, you know, the trespass offering. Uh, you're not going to get saved by doing that. You're not going to get saved because you, you, um, didn't break the top ten of the, of, of the commandments. We're saved through faith in Jesus Christ. And that's what he's, he's talking about. That does not mean that once you get saved and you're in the grace, you can do anything you want to do. And actually, that's just stupid. Because if you really have a true relationship with Jesus Christ, you don't want to do anything you want to. You want to live out of the Spirit and not out of the flesh. They that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Amen. Um, so Abraham, so if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof the glory, but not before God. In other words, if he could have gotten himself self declared righteous because he kept all the law just perfect, then he could boast, but not before God. For the, what's, what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it, his believing, was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. In other words, you're trying to earn your salvation. Now some people get this idea that once you get saved, um, that anything you do that's, that is in, in order to please God and to honor God and to do what God said is working for your salvation. No, you're saved. You're not trying to get your salvation. But your salvation should produce in you good works. They should produce in you good works. You should actually have a lifestyle that honors the Lord out of that salvation you've experienced. Okay? Okay. Um, but him, that, uh, but him that worketh not, but believeth on him uh, that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now, what's he talking about here? He is not talking about post-new birth walking. That's not the subject under discussion. That is not the intent of what he's saying here. That is not that if you go out and, 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 you know, and, and not commit adultery, you're working for your salvation. This is written as a reference to people getting saved or not getting saved, either by the works of the law or by faith in Jesus Christ. That is his discussion here. You cannot take this discussion and go on the other side of salvation and abdicate yourself from good works in Christ Jesus. It just doesn't work that way. That's not, that's not what he intended. He did not. He actually said, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith, 
What faith? The faith that is, now listen, I know that, you know, we can talk about faith for believing and receiving and walking by faith, but here this faith is the faith in Jesus Christ to redeem us out, out, out as an unbeliever coming into the kingdom of God. It is not talking about a lot of things try people make it say it's talking about. His faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom the Lord imputeth righteousness without works. See, here we are. We're receiving righteousness. What right, righteousness, an old English word used to translate the Greek word here, meaning right standing or in right relationship with. God imputes right relationship without works to what? To man or woman of faith. Saying, blessed are those whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. All right. Blessed is, to, is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. How did they come to the point of not having sin imputed to them? Faith in Jesus Christ, they received salvation. You cannot go out and live in sin and think it's okay and that the Lord's not going to impute sin to you. You will be judged according to those things. They may not send you to hell, but you'll lose a lot of rewards. Instead of getting the Taj Mahal, you might get, you know, the, 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 the uh, Clampett Cabin over in Tennessee. I'm not talking, well, I guess they moved it to that Los Angeles, put it in the backyard, didn't they? Cometh this blessedness upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham. Now, see, he is still arguing his case between the Jews adhering to the law and the Gentiles being outside the law that it still requires faith to come into the kingdom. This is his context. This is what he's talking about. He is not talking about that once you got saved and you came under grace through faith that you can commit adultery with your neighbor's wife and God don't care. And it's automatically forgiven when you did. That's not what this discussion is about. That is not what Paul is writing about here. But people teach that. And then they say, if you uh, say that God will judge individuals as a nation, you're sick. Well, I would like to talk to Ananias and Sapphire for a couple of minutes and ask them what happened with them. How was it reckoned? I'm sorry. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? Was he in circumcision or uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. Paul is trying to make the point that the fact that they were circumcised in the flesh did not mean a hill of beans as far as receiving grace, the grace of salvation through faith. You, you, if you were circumcised or uncircumcised, it didn't matter. As a matter of fact, Paul wrote to the church at Galatia and says, for in Christ Jesus, Galatians 5, 6, I believe, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith, which works by love. Amen. So he said there that, you know, that, that being circumcised or not being circumcised didn't mean anything. It was the faith walk. Hallelujah. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith he had yet been uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they may be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. Circumcision was a sign of the covenant. It was a natural sign of the, physical, of the spiritual covenant he had entered into. Amen. And the father of circumcision, to whom uh, are not of the circumcised only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. Paul is still going back and forth between the Jew and the Gentile. And he keeps making the same case over and over and over again. Whether you were outside the law or under the law, you have to be redeemed through faith in Jesus Christ. You don't get in because you got circumcised and you, you were, went to the temple and offered tur turtle doves. You don't get left out because you didn't do any of those things. It is faith in the redemptive work of God through Jesus Christ, his shedding of his blood, his penalty he paid for our sin, and being raised from the dead, his blood being brought to the mercy seat of God. Faith in him and his completed work of redemption that empowers an individual to receive the grace of salvation. So whether you're circumcised or uncircumcised, you can get in on the deal. And neither one gives you a leg up or puts you a leg behind. That's Paul's continuing argument. 
For the promise that he, he sh uh, should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, not to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Now, remember Galatians chapter uh, 3 says this, um, to the promise was made to Abraham and to his seed. And then he goes on down the, the 28th verse or so, or 27th, 28th, 28th verse, and says this, and if you be Christ, then possessive, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise thereof. It was the seed of faith. It was the lineage of faith in Jesus Christ. So what it was was that seed was Jesus. The promise was made to Jesus. And when you identify with him through, through faith in salvation and his redemptive work, you become Christ, you know, Christ, if, you be Abraham, if, you, if you be Christ, you belong to Jesus, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Glory to God. I say, yeah, glory to God. That's shouting grounds. Amen. Hallelujah. See, when we take, when you go to the scriptures and you're trying to prove, that, it just, it bugs me that people preach and people listen to and people adhere to teaching that allows them to go do whatever they want to. They're looking for an out to sin and be covered while they're doing it. If somebody says you can do whatever you want to do and it doesn't matter, you're under grace, that ought to upset you. Because there was a price paid to deliver you from the power of sin, and it was the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That price paid is greater than your desire to stay where you are. Now, I know, see, what, what it really is is a little bit of this is a bunch of psychological goobity God. We want to not make you feel bad. We want to make you feel better. You want to feel better about yourself, so you won't ever face condemnation. See, we'll get to Romans 8 eventually. There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. And somebody told, well, you know, that, that last half of that verse wasn't there in the original Greek. It's not in the minuscules. It's in the, it's in the major text. It's not in the minor text. We've got, we got two texts and two th schools of thought. But it is down in verse 4. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. If that's all, and that's all one continuing thought. It doesn't matter. If all verse 1, 2, 3, and 4, if at the bottom it says, who walk not after flesh, but after the spirit, let me tell you something. If you walk in the, if you walk in the flesh, you will experience condemnation. But no, we, we live in a society that, you know, I, I, was, I was reading um, a Facebook post by one of our, my pastor friends here in town, um, uh, Pastor Thornhill over at Life Community. He's talking about how people want to feel good gospel. Let me say something. The gospel will make you feel good if you walk in accordance with it. Amen? But you can't go out and live in sin and expect to feel good. So what we do, we use a bunch of psychological, we, we can't make them feel bad, you're okay. We all want to sing the Barney song. I love you, you love me, we're a happy family. With a great big hug and a kiss from me to you, won't you say you love me too? Don't you think that's so, baby Bob? And baby Bob's, you know, and we, we don't give, uh, you know, there's schools. You can't use red ink to make a correction on papers anymore because it makes the student feel bad. That, where my wife teaches when the students fail the course. They can't put failed now. They have to put retake. Because it makes them feel bad. We're all about feel good. We're all about touchy feely. Jesus came and he said, You know what he told his disciples to go tell everybody? He said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature and tell everybody that they're okay with me. Now, I didn't get one even grunt out of this crowd, and then you're my faithful bunch. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Amen. And what do you tell them to do? To say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I'm going to tell you something. The definition of repent simply being changed in your mind is a very shallow, very shallow uh, in translation or interpretation of that word. G the, the apostle Paul wrote and said this. He said, godly sorrow worketh repentance. If there is godly sorrow that makes you repent, then you didn't feel good when you were in sin. The gospel will address things in your life that are an enmity between you and God. 
It will address things in your life that are hindrances. To, what, did, what, did Paul, what did Paul write in the uh, uh, <clears throat> 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews? Wherefore lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Not only get rid of the sin, get rid of the weights. And he's talking to the church. He's talking to born-again folk. Yeah. He's talking to people who've been declared righteous by faith in Jesus Christ. He's talking to people who have received the lordship of Jesus, had the seal of the Holy Ghost, who are against their purchase redemption, glory to God, who are living under grace. And he said, lay aside weights and sins. Why? They beset you. They get you off track. To keep you out of where you're supposed to be. Godly sorrow, Scripture says, works repentance. It is not a justified position to take that when you have sinned, you should not have a sorrow about displeasing the Father. The fact that you've dishonored Him by your actions should bring a repentant heart to you so that you go and you get that right, you get it cleansed out of your life, you get reconciled in your relationship with the Father or your fellowship with the Father so that you don't have that enmity between you and you can move forward. But we're being taught by people now that you shouldn't feel bad that you committed adultery with your neighbor's wife. That you're living in fornication. That you're shooting up, smoking, doing drugs, drinking, all this kind of stuff. Because we're under grace. That's not what the grace of God is about. Paul addresses that. Further on, over in chapter 5, let's get into chapter 6. Shall we continue? And I know I'm way ahead of myself, but let's just go with it. Shall we continue in sin? Because What did you say right before that? For where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. What's he saying? The power of sin can be abounded by the power of grace. In other words, the power of sin in your life can be superseded by the power of grace in your life. But then he comes back and makes a statement. In other words, not that it's automatically taken care of. Shall we continue in sin that the grace can abound? God forbid. It's foolish to think that grace is there so you can continue doing what he delivered you from. He sent Jesus to get you out of that junk. Amen. Not to give you something that empowers you to stay there and still get to heaven. What does the scripture say? Come out from among them. And this is New Testament, folks. And touch not the unclean thing. Come out from among them, be ye separate, and touch not the unclean thing. Why? It's a hindrance to you. It is a stumbling block to you. It will keep you, it will hinder your faith. Apostle John wrote and said, if our heart condemns us not, then we have confidence. Didn't say if God condemns you not. If your heart condemns you not, then have we confidence towards him. And we know, he goes on to talk in that same passage about the fact because your heart not condemning you, we know that whatever we ask of him, we receive because our heart condemns us not. So righteousness, right standing with the Father is not a position of I can do whatever I want and get away with it and still go to heaven. The feel good of the gospel, let me tell you something. Can I say something here? Now, even I, the word of, and I, well, listen, I grew up classical Pentecostal, came over from the word of faith, kind of been in you know, those circles mo most of my life, classical Pentecostal, you know, for word of faith, uh, got good Baptist friends, okay, love the Lord, preach good stuff, I mean, they love Jesus, they do, want people to go to heaven, working, working for the Father in, in, in the fields of God, Hallelujah. But we have, you know, we, we try so hard to, to not make people ever feel bad. It's good news. What's good news to the person who's saved but living in sin? God will forgive you 
if you'll repent. That's the good news. The good news is not, it didn't matter what you did, God still, God, God covered it and you're automatically forgiven and it don't even, you don't even have to repent. You, you don't have to repent. That's the new thing. You don't have to repent. First John 1, 9 is not even in the, new, in, in, in the original Greek. That's what some people say now. You got some people got a Bible they found somewhere and that's not there. That, you're quoting that. This Bible shows that it's not even in there. Now, folks, it's in there. First John 1, 9, you know, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all, all, all unrighteousness. See, we, here, here's why we get mixed up with some of this stuff. He said confess your sins. But yet, when the Bible tells somebody to get saved, you're not told to confess your sins. You're, to call, you're told to confess the lordship of Jesus Christ. If we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, or Jesus is Lord, what the translation says, and believe in our heart God's raised from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the mouth, confession, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Romans chapter 8, verses 8, 9, and 10. Okay? So we find out you don't get saved by confessing all your sins. Bottom line, you can't anyway. John said, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Who's your See, before you get saved, your advocate is going to bring you to the blood and get you saved. After you're saved, if we sin, I have an advocate with the Father, and if I will confess my sin, he will cleanse me from all unrighteousness. The good news and the feel good is that once I confess that, I am cleansed from it by the blood of Jesus, and that'll, that'll bring joy to your heart. That'll bring, see, when we preach a feel good gospel about it doesn't matter what you do, you're righteous, you're under grace, go ahead and live it up, drink, smoke, seek, shoot up, take some weed, drop some pills, you know, drink your wine, drink your beer, you know, and all this stuff, and you're, you're going to go to heaven, and, and how much can I get away with? Because, you know, I'm under grace, glory to God, and I Everybody wants to, we all feel good. We're trying to convince people that everything's okay when it's not. Right. Why? Because it brings in the bucks. I'm just going to be real honest with you. It brings in the bucks. People will throw money at a place so they'll feel better. And what has, and, and go back and study our psychological histories, particularly in the past 100, couple, 150 years. What does everybody usually, well, I say everybody, let's say 98% of the people get out of a counseling session with psychologists. It's not your fault. Somebody else's fault. Somebody else has did this. Somebody else did that to you. This happened. Everything else is why you are where you are. No personal responsibility that I made a choice to conduct myself in this way because we don't want to make them feel bad. Now, I would, I would encourage a lot of you people out there, if, you, if you're counseling people, go get J, the Jay Adams Library. Now, he's, he is a, he's a Christian psychologist, but he has a method he calls nothetic counseling. It simply means confront them with the word. <laughs> I got a whole library of it. Tony could recommend it. I got his whole library. You can't read, you can't go with some, anybody. You read everything, all, everything they say is true. But his method, his technique, even as a psychologist, was nothetic counseling. Take the word, measure you against it. If you don't line up, change. Yeah, amen. 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 Instead, what we're getting out of our pulpits now is, you're just wonderful. God loves you. It doesn't matter what. We don't want you to feel bad. Yeah, I know you're sleeping with your neighbor's wife, but you know, you're under grace. It's automatically forgiven. Yeah, but you might end up dead because if honey comes home in the middle of the day and you're sleeping with sugar, he might put something in you called lead. So sure enough, that's right. We, we, we got to get back to understanding that the position of righteousness, see, man, when man sinned and man fell, he lost favor and he lost a position with God. And through the work of God, Jesus Christ, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. God put a plan in motion 
to bring man back into right relationship with him. What? Say he could keep living in the fallen state to elevate him so he could live in the created state, the planned state, what God designed and desired, not so he could keep living in the fallen state and get away with it. We're commanded. Paul writes to the church and says, put off the old man. Where is that? Somebody find that for me. Put off the old man and put on the new. Who's going for it? Come on. Who's got it? Where is it? Somebody Colossians? Where is it? Huh? Okay. If you've heard him and been taught by him that the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former comfort, I mean his lifestyle. The old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away uh, lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, and he goes down and starts listening to other stuff. Well, I don't want to stop there. For we are members one of another. Be angry, sin not, let not the sun go down on your wrath, neither give. Now he's talking to Christians. He's talking to church folk. Are you here? And it is believed, I believe Ephesians is considered maybe possibly one of the circular letters where when it got to a place, they just put the word Ephesus in there, but when it got to somewhere else, they ought to see or whatever, it was put in there. He wrote this to the church at large. Let him steal, stole, uh, that stole, steal no more. Oh, no, I'm under grace. It don't matter. No, he said, if you, did, if you were stealing, don't stop it. Rather let him labor, working with his hands, that thing which is good. Working in good. Work is good. Amen. That he may give, have to give to him that needeth. See, it's beyond you. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But, <clears throat> but that which is good to use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Now that just sinks the teaching that because you're under grace, none of it matters. That one passage that you're automatically doing this and you're automatically doing that. Paul said, I'm writing to you and telling you one thing. Put that old man off and put the new man on. That's right. And then put off all the stuff that goes along with it. Right. Amen. Amen. He's talking to righteous folk. Yes. Born again. And in all likelihood, tongue talking. <laughs> Scroll toting. <Amen. laughs> Some of y'all got that. <laughs> Believers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, put off that old man, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new man. Yeah. And in the process of that, stop doing this and stop doing that. And if you used to do this, don't do that anymore. He did not write to him and say, because you're under grace, you're automatically going to stop doing this. Woo! And that went over real big. Come on, church. See, if we read Scripture and understand what's being said, God called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Why would you want to walk in the darkness? Honestly, if you've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus and his grace has been applied to your life, why would you seek ways to be as much like you used to be and still get to heaven when the price paid to get you out was so great? Amen. I question that. Oh, you're judging me. No, I'm not judging you. 
See, you judging me. Judge not. Yo, hate preacher. Man, I'm going to tell you, if Paul was here today, he'd be called a hate preacher. He'd be called intolerant. Right now, everybody tries to call him the grace preacher because they picked, cherry picked certain scriptures out that he said and built a teaching on it and left everything else out. I, I, I said this the other day. I quoted Guy Dunnick, my friend Guy Dunnick, because you know that, that uh, God resists the proud just as much as he gives grace to the, to the humble. He says, you know, he says that. He says, God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Actually, he said he resists the proud before he gives grace to the humble. He's just as actively resisting the proud as he is giving grace to the humble. But we don't want to say that because it makes people feel, we think it makes people feel bad. You know what's going to make them feel bad? Having the Father say, you didn't do what I asked you to do. But Pastor So-and-so told me it was okay. It don't matter what they tell you. I got a phone call today. I, I, we had a credit card for the, uh, for the ministry that we had. And I called and asked them on the due day. I said, now how much, you know, I've, I've just paid this. But something seems out of, out of kilter here. Is everything? No, you're good until September. Got a phone call today. Can you pay all this? I said, wait a second. I just talked to your people on the 12th. And they told me everything was good until September. No, and they, this, guy's, this guy must have been a collections guy because he's pounding me to get all this money. And I said, I will pay the past due amount that you're saying now is past due as soon as I can. And I'll pay the rest on the due date. Now, I want, you know, we need to go ahead and pay that earlier. I said, I will pay it on the due date. But see, well, I apologize. They, they gave you misinformation. Yeah, they gave me a misinformation, and we budgeted according to it. Right. I took the initiative to call to make sure right. that we were where we were supposed to be, and now you're going to penalize me. You can't go. Listen, you, you, go, you can't go to and say, uh, television so-and-so said such and such. That advocates me for the responsibility. He told me it was all right for me to commit fornication. I was under grace. Now, they don't say that. Now, you ain't going to have anybody dumb enough to get on television and go, you can commit fornication and it doesn't matter, you're under grace. But they will say things like, all your sins are automatically forgiven, you don't need to repent, da 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 And it's saying the same thing. Because I usually replace all your sin with what sin it is. And of course, you get to a certain point and sin's no longer sin. Why? Because it's already forgiven. If it was already for, see, God, we have to understand the role and the relationship of faith and receiving what God has already provided for us. Remember, we shared this with you recently. The book of Revelation talks about that whosoever, whoever's name was not blotted out. What does that mean? God's already forgiven them and written their name in the book. But I'm going to tell you something. That if you don't show up at the right place at the right time with the right answer, it gets blotted out. What do you mean? If you, if you reject the lordship of Jesus Christ and die in that state, your name gets blotted out. You don't go to heaven. Yes, God in his mind has already forgiven you. God has already accepted you into the kingdom. What? Do you think, don't you understand God is a God of faith also? And he's exercising his faith. But it's a faith that you will. You still have to make the choice. We are not, he doesn't make us. It's not, it's not, he doesn't make you get saved. You either accept him or you don't. It's your choice. It is a free will. And so he's already, in other words, when we say this, he's already done all he's ever going to do about sin. If you take that wrong, you'll mess up. So it don't matter what I do, it's already taken care of. No. The unsaved man, if he does not come to Jesus Christ, although God's already done all he's ever going to do about the salvation of that individual, 
Jesus went to the cross. Jesus carried his sin. Jesus was raised from the dead for his justification and sat down at the right hand of the Father, and his name is in the Lamb's book of life. If he does not receive Jesus Christ as Lord, even though God has already done everything he needs to do about that person's sin, they will reach over there and blot his name out, and he will go to hell. God's not willing to see. Well, it was God's will for them to go to hell. God, the Bible says God's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to the knowledge of the truth. So you just can't take your, 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 your scriptures out on election out and go build a doctrine that's, 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 that's skewed. God doesn't want anybody going to hell. He sent Jesus to redeem you from hell. Glory. If you reject it, you get blotted out. I've said this a couple weeks ago, but I grew up Pentecostal. We, we, we get up on some services, you know, Wednesday, sometimes, usually Sunday night or Wednesday night, you know. We just get singing, there's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine. Oh, yes, it's mine. And we can sing about, there's a new name. How unscriptural. I know what they were trying to say. Somebody got saved and came to the Lord, glory to God. But it's unscriptural. That name wasn't written down the day you got saved. It was written down when Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and he entered into the presence of the Father with his own blood leading captivity, captive glory to God. All of humanity's name was written in the Lamb's book of life. The sad side is the people who reject it get it blotted out. Glory to God. Thank God for those who receive through faith, the salvation of God by his grace. But we're called into that walk that righteousness should be producing a lifestyle that honors God. I saw a picture recently on Facebook of a, of, of a minister and some people in this church out somewhere. They're drinking wine and beer. Posting it on Facebook. I mean, it's like how... I dear God, hope some alcoholic who got saved didn't see that and know what they're doing and look at that and go, it's okay to drink and go back into that world. We got Christians now say it's okay to smoke dope. It's an herb of the field. God gave us herb of the fields. You think I'm joking. I'm not joking. God did not give you that to smoke dope. Hello. And I got to say, some of the things on this planet are part of the fall. And are not doing what they were designed to do. You just can't go find something and say, well, God put it here. It's part of the fall now. It's, it's cursed. The ground is cursed. So there are things on the earth that weren't designed by God to do what they're being used for now. Because they got under the curse. See, we don't think about that. So we're trying to justify something. Oh, God put it here. No, I don't believe he did. Because the ground's cursed. Go back and read Genesis. How many can grow a garden? How many can grow weeds better? You got to live by the sweat of your brow. You got to tend that. You got to watch it. You got to take care of it all the time. Or the weeds will take over. Thorny weeds. Gonna go pull them out. You better have on some nice thick leather gloves. I'm gonna eat your fingers up, your hands up. Ground's cursed. Well, my ground's not cursed. I'm blessed. Come in, but I get it. But everywhere else is. That's a negative confession. No, God cursed the ground, and we don't have scripture that He uncursed it. What's good? Why? Well, uh, rede yeah, redemption, a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth passed away. The ground won't be cursed in the new earth. Amen? It means them nasty, stupid weeds that get in your flower bed won't be in the one in your, in your spiritual household in heaven. Eat ba 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 if you come by my house, there's four things in the front flower. Better not flowers. 
<laughs> about this tall. Every time I get ready to work in the yard, it rains. <laughs> okay. Hallelujah. I'm going to get him eventually. I'm going to get that sucker. I'm going to cut him off. I'm going to take weed, I mean, um, round up full strength and just pour in those things. So he just... <laughs> Praise the Lord. Y'all with me? See, this is Paul's cry. He talks about, you know, doing these things. And then, and then it gets over back over, it's back over Romans chapter 4. We didn't even come close to finish. That's why I told you this, this series is going to take longer than a year. It's going to take two years, I think. And maybe a year and a half at least. Y'all about all right with that? We're going to get some good stuff next week. But, you know, we, I got, just kind of got this, you know, you know. We're down about to verse 12. We'll pick up here next week. But we don't want to get off into error. We don't want to follow this, this foolishness of, of money launderers, of spiritual carpetbaggers. Well, you're just jealous. They got a lot of money. I, well, I'm sure I'd like to have lots of money. But you know what? I don't want lots of money. The, the price of having to stand before God and say, you led my people astray. I don't want that. Brother Randy, Greer, thank you, preached about 2008, 2009, 2010. There was a coming separation in the church. He had different names for the informational church and the spirit, and he, and he called it something else, informational something else. But it was basically this, those who were going to go the way of the spirit and those who were going to go the way of the flesh. And it was going to happen in 2011, and boy, did it ever. We saw it really start manifesting in 2011, and that gap is getting wider and wider every day. People who, who walked in the Spirit and knew the ways of the Spirit and, and understood the things of God are selling out for their flesh. And there are lots of people who are willing to give it to them so they can live in the flesh and feel good. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Amen? Resist the devil. The Bible tells us to humble yourself, resist the devil. He'll flee from you. But if you live in his territory, he ain't going nowhere. I like churches that just tell me, listen, we, I, love, I can preach the good stuff. I was preaching earlier good stuff. Got the preach going. But I'm also required to give you the, 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 the teaching so you can walk upright before the Lord in all your ways. So you can walk in the fullness of the blessing. I want you walking in the fullness of the blessing. Can you say amen? We trust that you were blessed by the word of God and the flow of the spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, PO Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.